event tonight is Lauren Harrison, who is from the product and product marketing team for Confluence at Atlassian. And she is a product manager there, product, product manager there. And uh, the product and product marketing team for Confluence is on a virtual ACE tour around the globe. And we are the first international stop tonight uh, on this tour. Um, and we are very too happy to have you, Lauren. Lauren is joining us tonight from Arizona. So good morning to Arizona. And over to you, Lauren, and I will just disappear while you prepare for your slides. Great, thank you for the introduction. Um, give me a moment to share my slides. So thank you all so much for having me. I know joining a online webinar during this COVID times is a little bit less exciting, a little bit less engaging, but I appreciate you being here nonetheless. Um, uh, my name is Lauren Harrison. I'm a product marketing manager at Lassian for Confluence, as was already said. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on Confluence Cloud. Um, of course, I can try to answer a couple of questions on Confluence data center or server, but just know that that's not really my specialty. Um, and so without further ado, I'll jump into what I'll be covering today. So I'll cover a couple common problems and solutions that we think we've heard from customers they're um, having with Confluence Cloud specifically, and some of the most recent updates to our products that are helping ameliorate some of those issues. And so those are some highly requested mobile updates. Um, we'll also cover some of the perks that admins have in the control of the Confluence Premium Edition, so additional kind of lovers and controls that enable admins to do their job better. And then finally, I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And so um, I hope you'll give me some feedback, but also I'm here to answer any and all of your questions. So um, plenty of time for that at the very end. Um, so I'll jump right in. So I think we can all acknowledge that Confluence today is pretty complex. Um, We've added a lot of features over the past few years, but we haven't made the product more useful or accessible, particularly to new users that are coming in for the very first time. And so as a result, it's really difficult to get started using Confluence as a new team member, which creates a lot of added overhead for site admins, a lot of extra work to get people onboarded and started with Confluence. Um, also, the product isn't always tailored to helping teams be successful, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, regardless of their role. Um, they kind of come into Confluence and they see this blank canvas, a powerful blank canvas, but a blank canvas nonetheless. And so that's not always the best experience. Um, we also don't always play nicely with other tools. I think that's a, a gap that we acknowledge between our cloud products and our server products that um, sometimes we don't have all the apps and integrations that you might need to integrate with your other tools that you're using. Um, and then finally, um, the product doesn't always scale. And so we acknowledge like Confluence Cloud, of course, if you have a large team, you want to be able to scale and have confidence that that product will be reliable and performant at scale for all of your users. Um, and so that's definitely something we're working on as a team. Um, so to address some of these issues, we've made a number of improvements to the product experience, including a simplified core experience, especially in the sign up flow and kind of an onboarding flow. Um, and we've been improving the onboarding for admins and end users to make it easier just to get going, get in the product and start using it, especially if you're introducing Confluence to a new team internally. Um, We've added templates that hopefully remove some of the barriers of um, getting started with Confluence. So when you jump in, um, you're not just given that blank canvas, you can start with best practices or other things to get you going. Um, we've also added some new exciting integrations with common tools that we think a lot of our, our customers use and find beneficial. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, we're, we're gearing up to make the the product more performant and scalable to 10,000 plus users. So I'll jump right in with a few kind of um, tutorials or quick demos of 
each of these things. So first, um, here's a quick demo of how we've improved the onboarding and setup process for your instance today. Um, we're simplifying the onboarding so that all members of your organization can quickly get started with Confluence without your help. So for example, example, we're helping new users quickly find teammates and spaces that they already work with um, so they can jump right into collaborating with that team. Um, new us users will land on their new home experience where they can orient themselves, find recent work, and discover new information that can be valuable. And finally, our search has definitely improved. It's faster than ever, but we have also a few new search filters and advanced search um, kind of toggles that are making it easier and more intuitive for users to find the content and the people that they're looking for. Cool. Um, so moving on to the template gallery, hopefully you've seen a few of our templates already. We're continuously um, adding to the template gallery, but we've also built a new experience, um, making them even easier to access. And our new template gallery features um, 80 rich and useful templates for every team, but now you can also explore and preview templates directly from the gallery so that you don't create an unnecessary page. Maybe you choose a template that you thought was something else, you add it and you're like, oh shoot, now I gotta delete this page. Sometimes that's difficult. So now with this preview feature, um, you'll have a little bit more understanding of what you can add um, and what that template actually looks like. Next, I'll jump into slash commands. So obviously macros are a huge part of what makes Confluence powerful. And now the new introduction of slash commands will help you find and implement those without leaving the line of thought or what you're actually typing on that Confluence page. Um, so within the new editor, um, this, this um, slash command feature will highlight some of um, uh, your favorite Confluence existing features like hierarchies, expanded text and color options, and slash commands. And so slash commands let you search for any macro, like inserting an action item or a table or an emoji without leaving that line of text. Um, you can even insert a Google Doc or a Microsoft Office Doc in real time with that embedded preview. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of like copy pasting that, um, that link to that Google Doc or that Microsoft Office Doc. Um, onto the page in that preview or that interactive kind of engagement with that um, doc that's living in um, Google Docs onto your page. And so it's dynamic, it automatically updates, but um, it also, you can edit it from the page should you want to. Um, so that way Confluence kind of becomes your source of truth for a given product or um, product launch, or maybe it's a project you're working on. Um, we found that this um, app application in particular is very useful. Um, so I'll jump into analytics and inline comments. Um, a couple more engagement features like in analytics and editor mode comments will help your team keep more engaged, align, especially in this remote time where we're all kind of relying heavily on, on tools like Confluence and Jira to kind of work asynchronously um, without the ability to work in person in an office. And so um, in context, page anal analytics can help you quickly track how your content is being viewed and interacted with in your organization. So you simply click the analytics option at the top um, and later we'll preview the more advanced analytics available in premium like site and space level data and more in depth page engagement um, analytics and search statistics. Um, our new and improved commenting feature makes it easier to have team discussions, um, mark up content, and express your opinions to get done faster. As you probably saw, you can now add um, comments while you're in editor mode. So rather than having to click publish, you can jump straight into um, commenting while in the editor mode. 
that kind of streams line, streamlines that process. I know personally, it's one of the most frustrating things I, I find with Confluence and just the ability to uh, collaborate and interact while in editor mode is just made that little difference in my day and improved that, that kind of collaboration feature. Um, so now I'll jump into some mobile updates. And so uh, I don't know if all of you are using mobile. Um, we've definitely made a hu some huge improvements to the experience there. So maybe it's something you might consider um, using your, on your phone if you're open to kind of blending that work and life balance on your phone. I know for me, it's really nice to be able to look at quick updates on my mobile device. And even though I might not respond to it right away, um, I have a feeling what I'm going into on my daily commute, when commutes were a thing, I, I know. But um, so I'll jump into a couple of the new features we have on the mobile editor um, to facilitate that process. Um, so we've been working hard to make sure the mobile experience matches your web experience and just looks and feels a little bit more similar. Um, so we recently rolled out a new editor on mobile. Um, the mobile editor uses some of the same platform components on the web and looks and feels similar to even JIRA. So a lot of the same kind of actions, snippets, decisions, um, call outs will look and feel the same way. And um, as opposed to before where it was a little bit more just like kind of basic text um, editing capabilities and not quite as dynamic or um, visual. Uh, we're also rolling out a new viewing experience on mobile. So when you're on the go and you wanna stay informed, you can read pages quickly and they'll appear just as they do on the web. I know that sounds like kind of a small thing, but um, but in the past, that experience of looking at it and um, it not looking the same as what you come into the office and you look at when you're actually on your web device, um, I think that was definitely a pain point for a lot of customers. Now I'll jump into some premium admin features. So um, we launched premium a little while ago with a, a core feature set, but we've definitely kind of added to that feature set with time and it's getting more and more robust as a product offering. And so we're really excited to show you some of the premium features that we've been working on for admins specifically, who are in gro growing organizations where maybe um, the option to manually kind of um, manage users and pages is becoming kind of burdensome. And so, now they have the opportunity to manage some of those things a little bit better at scale with a few of these new features. Um, so when an admin creates a new space, you can first select the type of space, um, whether it be blank or a different kind, um, a knowledge base or a project space, for example. And so you can also set permissions at the time of that site creation or that space creation. Uh, using default settings or copying from another space. So we found that if you have an existing space that you're really just trying to replicate those permissions, um, this makes it really easy to do so. You don't have to manually go in and set their permissions for this new space, um, especially when you already kind of have those set up for your organization. This can definitely be a time saver. Um, and that way, yeah, I mean, it's already kind of set up for you and you don't have to manually go in and do that. Um, so page archiving is a new feature that we're excited about. It's a great way to clean up your spaces without completely losing the content. And so, um, of course, we all have kind of those outdated pages from three, five, I mean, Atlassian, we have some pages that are 10, <laughs> 10 plus years ago. And so, uh, of course, you don't want to lose that context if you really want to refer back to a previous project or you want to see the results of that experiment or that um, launch in the past, you don't want to lose that information, but maybe this is a good in between where you can archive that content and so kind of clean up your space, lose a lot of that heavy weight that people have to sift through when they're going through search um, without totally losing the context. And so 
Um, basically, it can be done on a page by page basis for free or standard. Um, but in premium, you can um, select multiple pages at once to archive. So if you're just looking to do a full kind of clean sweep of your space or instance, you can go through check the ones that you'd like to archive. Um, and there you go. It's like Marie Kondo. Um, and uh, so we also have a new thing, a new feature called admin key. So if you're an admin, you've probably seen a message similar to this one. Um, someone needs access to a page and is locked out. Uh, it's something that you kind of constantly have to deal with and field those requests um, pretty often. And so with admin key, you can get temporary access to restricted pages to get in really quickly and get a better understanding of what the permissions are for that page. So um, restricted pages appear in your page tree and you can make permission changes as necessary to unblock people. Um, you can also, so there are situations that might have taken your admin um, weeks or days to fix. And so now that can be fixed in a fraction of the time just by having the visibility and the, the ability to jump into that page get an understanding of the existing permissions and um, get a quick feeling of whether or not that person should or should not have access to that page. Um, this also helps, we've seen with um, those that have people that have left the organization, maybe they were the owner of that page and had defined the permissions for that page. And so now that as long as there are still admins within that space, they can go in and inspect the permissions and maybe adjust them um, with the change of that person having left the company or, you know, moved on to a different team. So inspecting permissions. Um, oh, yeah, here's a quick demo of what that looks like. The thing that I was just um, kind of partially, partially describing. Um, but yeah, it, you can figure out who has ac access to certain pages and who doesn't. And then you can go and adjust those permissions in the permissions dialog of any page. Um, while this feature is mainly for admins, um, and users can use it too. And so I referenced the premium admin analytics earlier. So this is kind of a demo of what I was referencing there. It's um, It lets you get insights into and stay on top of how your team is using Confluence. So get a feeling of what teams are using it the most. Should you expand Confluence or should you kind of like pull it in, rein it in more because people really aren't looking or viewing at the, those pages. So this is especially helpful if you're kind of using Confluence as a knowledge base that someone refers to for your help desk, for HR documents, um, or externally for like a kind of a help center for your customers if you have a better understanding of how people are viewing and interacting with that content can give you insights into what content you should be focusing on. And so, um, yeah, it's basically a better understanding of how your team is using Confluence. You can see what content is most active and what people in your organizations are looking for and identify what content is out of date or unused as well. Um, advanced analytics include site and space level data and more in-depth page engagement page engagement analytics and search stats. So this is just like one kind of last thought I'll leave you with. Um, think of a team in your organization that's not using Confluence today and um, would some of these features help you, um, help them transform the way they work? Or um, I guess this is a good time to Kind of jump into we have a few re resources that i'll point all of you to but then i'd love to get some feedback on what you think is working for confluence for your organization and whether or not you think these new features might help your team and then what are your kind of favorite parts of um, confluence but before that i do want to point out some really great resources some of which have been around for a while. I mean, Team Central is kind of advice on how to's and using Confluence products at a broader level. Um, we found it really useful as a team to kind of look at plays that we can implement just to facilitate, especially remote collaboration. Um, and so also, of course, webinars similar to this one where you can discover past webinars 
um, and upcoming ones on atlassian.com slash webinars. There are a bunch on Confluence, data center, cloud, server, everything um, that can help you kind of like get inspired and um, look at ways that other teams and other groups are using Confluence to power work. So um, that could be something to check out. And finally, I'm super excited about the new Confluence guide. So I personally worked on these. If you go to atlassian.com, but then slash software confluence and guides, um, you'll be taken to a series of resources and about 10 new user guides that we've kind of centralized on um, atlassian.com. And uh, we've definitely heard a lot of great feedback so far. It's, it's um, uh, like a great resource for how to quickly get started with your team, but then everything from best practices, new apps and integrations that you can use, um, and even like some uh, kind of guidance on how to use Confluence with Jira um, Service Desk or Jira software. And so without further ado, I'll kind of jump into some feedback um, if we wanna open up the communication channels a little bit more. Yes, I will do that right now. And we also have three questions. Um, oh, great. And we have a chat. So we can ask the question for the chat. What's your favorite feature in Confluence? So if you have one, write it in the chat. But we have four questions right now. So I, I just read them out while I promote everybody to the panel. Um, so first question, will the onboarding wizard come to the Confluence server as well? The new onboarding features? Yes. Will that um, be a server feature as well, or will you keep them in the cloud? So far, they're just in the cloud, and they're being tested, and we're getting a lot of feedback on them. Um, to my knowledge, they're not coming to server yet, because we have a little bit less control of that onboarding experience when it comes to server, um, as it's a little bit more managed by the team itself. But um, I can check on that and get back to you and ask the server team if that's anything they're trying to improve as well. Okay. Second question. Um, can you check the most 10 most viewed pages or the 10 longest not viewed pages? Hmm. 10 so can most I, can I, viewed pages. The top 10 or the, the, the low 10, basically, the last 10. Can I, Least viewed pages. Yeah. My understanding is yes from what I've seen of the page analytics and kind of admin analytics feature, um, you can definitely look at the pages with the most and the least engagement and kind of stack rank them. Um, yeah. Okay. And number three, that copying of space permissions sounds great. Will that come to server <laughs> again? Uh, did Atlassian consider to introduce something like permission schemes for Confluence like the ones in Jira? Permission scheme? Um, so that you, the, have, that you can create a confluence space from template with permission schemes and, and project roles and whatnot uh, included, basically. Yeah, I think this is part of our kind of transition to get a little bit closer to that, to be able to create those schemes, those schemas. Um, to my understanding, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think that like, as we get a little bit better with permissions and like the feature I just discussed, um, It'll become easier with time, but I don't think we're all the way towards the full-blown kind of like um, permission scheme like there is on JIRA. Um, regarding whether or not this feature will come to a Confluence server, I, I think it's a little bit more difficult. Like my understanding is that because um, we cannot look at the analytics within um, your server instance, like we don't, we as Atlassians, not that we have a ton of like visibility into that now, it's all kind of automated on the back end. And when we're pulling those analytics about different Confluence pages, it's um, like a machine doing that in the background. But with a server instance, we don't even have visibility into how many people are looking at a particular page within your server because it's completely separate from our back end. It's not controlled in the same way. And so for us to, um, it, it, I think it'd be almost impossible for us to look at the page analytics of a particular 
page or, or space within uh, Confluence server. Um, but yeah, sorry about that. I know it's frustrating. <laughs> it's a great feature. Um, okay. And the last one, um, is there a plan to make synchrony restart automatically? On server, the synchrony service breaks down sometimes. So far, an admin is needed, needed to restart it while saving is not possible. Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know a ton about this. It sounds like it's an application on Confluence server. Um, so is that Frank, correct? Frank, you can switch on your audio if you want to explain that a bit, little bit more. I... Yeah, sure. Uh, so the Synchrony service is for uh, collaborative editing on a uh, Confluence server. And uh, we experienced that it uh, broke down a couple of times. We got the note as an admin that the collaborative editing is not working and we should take actions. When we follow that, we can only like restart uh, the service. But like, I'm curious if there could be just like a switch to uh, make it like to auto restart if something happens. Right, yeah. I mean, again, this is stretching my understanding a little bit on um, kind of the server side of things. I'm sorry, that sounds really frustrating and I, that's not a great experience at all. Um, I wonder if there's a good way for me to follow up with you after this. Um, maybe I can ask someone internally about kind of that server app in particular and get back to you just because I don't know a ton, like I'm just being honest uh, about the server experience, but um, at least I can kind of transfer that, that question back internally and maybe get back to you because that does sound like a, a frustrating experience. And again, like on the server side, we, like we as Atlassian definitely have less control of, of the, um, whether or not something automatically is restarted, for example, like an app, um, because it's not managed by us. Um, but there might be some kind of fix that I don't personally know about. So I'm happy to, um, kind of like email you after this and maybe we can um, get some questions answered. We have a post open in community at Lessing.com and you can add any answers that you have um, there or I can send them to me and I will put them in our archive in Confluence. Okay, yeah, so that would be great. Follow up. Um, and we have two questions from the chat, which are a bit very specific. Um, okay. so, so I will have to ask the uh, any development or timeline for Conf Cloud 67714 link feature on the new editor doesn't reliably list results. So that seems to be a bug. Um, an open bug. That's, that sounds like a, a server bug that is. Conf Cloud, um, Conf Cloud 67714. Uh, oh, is this a ticket? A, um, yeah, a Jira that's a, a Jira ticket. ticket. ConfCloud 67714 link feature on the new editor doesn't reliably list results. I don't know. If, if, if you don't know that from the top of your head, maybe that's also some one thing to, to take along. and, and Yeah, I periodically, I do look at those, um, uh, the Jira, like Jira request tickets and Jira issue tickets. I, I don't personally know. Um, when that will be fixed, but I can get back to you on it. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, like on the product marketing side, I'm a little bit further from development even than a product manager. So um, I apologize that I don't know. Okay, now we keep a head. copy. We keep a copy of these, so um, I will send them to you after the the webinar, and you maybe can relay them to to somebody that. Um, yeah. And take a look at those because the next one is as specific. That's uh, any progress for Conf Cloud seven six eight one label management, renaming, merging, deleting. Okay, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I I think that'll be kind of a similar situation where I might have to go look at the ticket itself and okay. fully understand what it is, but also yeah. um, understand when a fix might come out. Okay, we keep a we keep a. Um, a copy of these and I will relay them to you and you maybe can send me Perfect. back an answer and then I will publish that with the yes. notes and everything. Perfect. Sounds good. 
and uh, the questions keep on coming. So, um, um, yeah. so the next question is, what is your admin roadmap of features that work between Jira software and Confluence? You briefly talked about the possibility of reuse of Jira permissions that can be applied against any project. Are there any common admin features that are being put on the roadmap? Trying to avoid treating both products as completely different applications to manage. So the question is, is uh, in the direction, will there be a, for, for uh, a kind of unified administration console in the future for things that can be managed for both applications, like users right. and whatnot? Yeah. Um. I think my understanding of where that lies is kind of with Atlassian Access, and mm -hmm. that is kind of like the crowd version for cloud, where um, it is a centralized user management system that's kind of a layer above. It applies to your Atlassian organization, which is essentially like all of the products that you use within cloud, particularly. And so that is a means to um, enable and disable access to different uh, uh, products within your Atlassian suite um, from that centralized host. So um, the, it kind of adds a, another layer of admin. So you have your organization admin and then you have your site admins kind of a layer beneath. Um, so that is a way to kind of centralize management a little bit more, um, but specifically on kind of um, pulling JIRA uh, permissions over into Confluence. I think that's something we're working on. Um, so some of the work that I do internally is on the Better Together team. So it's improving experiences when users are moving between products. So using um, Jira and then moving over into Confluence or using Jira Service Desk and then moving into Confluence. And so they are looking to improve it from an end user standpoint and in terms of kind of facilitating that flow between the products, making it a little bit easier to switch between them and um, uh, manage content between the two tools. But I don't know if permissions is a part of that. Like I haven't personally heard of any um, new updates on transitioning permissions um, that are existing within Jira over into Confluence. Um, but that might just be it because a different team is working on it. Um, maybe it's the identity team and people that work specifically on kind of like uh, the kind of administrative portal that I was referencing before rather than the end user experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll add that to the list of things that I need to look up because it's a growing list at this point. Um, but hopefully like even looking at um, Atlassian Access might help you a little bit in terms of looking at um, an even more layered or kind of a contextual hierarchy of, um, of user permissions and managing them from that high level. If you're looking to manage across a whole lot of products, I think that especially can be useful. Uh, Gerard, do you want to add something to that? Your audio is still mute. You're still on mute. No, actually, that was it. But uh, the, the difficulty for me is that I have to manage both sets of users. And so sometimes I have to duplicate the same the same features, you know, that people request from one side and the other. And lately, the difficulty has been to manage the, uh, the access to the various pages or the various uh, spaces, mm -hmm. especially in the context of having vendors coming and doing development for us. If it's an internal person, I can more freely you know, grant access, but when you have vendors that come in to do work for you, you want to tailor specifically, and that creates an, in, you know, a significant increased amount of work on me, just as an admin to do that. That's good. In fact, that. sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, you know, Confluence is not just used by a corporation, it's used by its partners and its customers. And so different, I mean, you have the, what do you call that, uh, the universal access, um, Anonymous access, there we go. Yeah. So people can come and you know that then they have free access, but if you want to do a partial piece that becomes more complicated. Right. But um, but a unified access would be great. Yeah. I think I've heard a similar feedback, but not around Jira software and it's more relating to uh, like Jira's service desk and whenever someone comes in and they're working with 
external partners or customers and they only want customers to be able to search and view um, a certain set of Confluence pages from their Jura service desk service desk. Um, that is a big issue. And so this is kind of like a new take on that where you're saying like, if someone's coming in and being an external partner and doing work for you, maybe a contractor or a consultant, mm -hmm. um, is that kind of the use case? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you don't, I'm just, I'm saying it out loud to make sure I understand. Um, so when they come in and they are doing development work for you, you want them to only be able to view certain Confluence pages in the same way that they can only view certain JIRA issues. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, t so the way I've solved it so far is that I create specific projects with specific permissioning, but for each client that has, where I have a vendor, I have to make a special allowance and that becomes burdensome after a while to manage mm -hmm. them all. I mean, it's like a mess. Yeah, no, I can understand that, definitely. And that's okay, where, that's where Jira feedback. is more advanced because you have groups and project roles and and even issue type level security or um, so issue level security that you can set uh, and manage in a template or in a, in a scheme in that case. Yeah, that's right. That's mm -hmm. what I do in Jira yeah. and it's really yeah. nice to have. I yeah. just wish we could bring this over to Confluence. Yeah, we have something uh, we use for that. Uh, we introduced like a permission group for that particular role, for example, like <laughs> for uh, externals. Uh, so they work or an internal company and an internal department. So they have a specific role set and they have their role inside the team. And so we grant them or we make them member of a group in crowd, which reflects that uh, role inside the company and the team. And we use that uh, group uh, in order to uh, grant uh, permissions in Jira and Confluence. So in the end, so when you have like fluctuating uh, people or more people joining, leaving, whatever, uh, from that company, you can just add them to the group and you don't need to uh, touch any page or uh, space or project permissions. So you just have that there and the, uh, you can manage who can see which application via the uh, Jira users, the Confluence users groups for example, so or an additional user group which just like has the restricted access, so that you basically only allow the spaces or projects you want them to see uh, with uh, those particular groups which are only used for that. So I, I would strongly recommend not to use them as applic for application access, but just within the application for permission. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit of work in the, in the beginning because you need to, to pick first and then just like stick to it that you uh, add the internal admin group first on pages that you still can see it. And then of course the other, uh, the other groups, um, but you can see them on the page permissions or on the space permissions directly, which team can see what and you, uh, you don't have to split between, uh, uh, let's say, external or restricted user groups, which are like not reflecting who is in it from the name. So you can just like see it from the name, who can access it and can like grant or withdraw uh, permissions directly on that role base. I'll give it a try actually. Sounds interesting. And if you have any questions in the follow-up, again, there's a post on community uh, at Atlassian.com, which will also be in the show notes. So that is also uh, a place to meet up again and uh, exchange further questions and answers. So just add them to the original post. To not miss them. And I think it's also perfect for discussion over the breakfast. So we can look for solution and so on. That's also the idea of the breakfast, bringing their, our own topic and discuss about that yeah. stuff. Yeah, and we have a lean coffee with the breakfast, so you can bring any topic and we will talk them through on Thursdays. Other questions for Lauren? Or feedback in general. Or feedback, yeah. Yeah, any 
Um, I mean, this is your opportunity to kind of share anything that's frustrating. I know it sounds like I've gotten some of that through some of your questions too, but um, if there's anything you kind of want me to translate back to the team or bring back um, or things that you think are working well, um, we're always trying to base things the, off. The, there's one. Yeah. The, there's, there's one thing that's difficult for my company and it's the pricing of the premium with some of the features. <laughs> we're not a large company and to go to my CEO and says, oh, I need the feature for my administration, you know, to, to improve uh, what I need to do. And that will cost twice the price of what we have today when only one or two people are going to use these features. It's an expense that I haven't been able to, to justify at this point. And many of the features that you have are, are on the premium version. I think the premium version would work if it was not, you know, against all users, but the users that use it. And right now by charging those who come just once a week, maybe once a month, the full premium fee, um, my management finds it that it's not acceptable to pay for that much. And now on the, on the cloud system, you know, all users are the same. It's the same with the add-on, by the way. You know, I use a bunch of add-ons because they're meaningful to half a dozen people, but we have about 120, 130 users and none of them use these features, but yet we have to pay for it. So the scheme that is being applied against uh, the unit of users uh, is hard to sell within the company. So I'm not sure how you can move this along or what you might want to do in the future with it, but, but it's a painful pill. In fact, so much so that I'm being asked to review other products as a, you know, as a result, because it's, we're at a point where we could get something else for about the same price. I don't really want to change because I like what I have, but I'm being pressured to look at other alternatives because of the price consideration. That's uh, also when I, if I may add to that, that is a major gap in, in, in Atlassian's product policy from my side because many other cloud services like Microsoft with Office 365, you can mix and match different license levels. So you could, ma uh, to put it in your lingo, you could match a premium seat and, uh, and a normal seat. Um, and you, you can scale one seat at a time and can switch them on or off on a monthly basis, if you like. So if I have a project for three months and I need 20 additional licenses, uh, I add just these 20 licenses and I need five premium licenses of those. And after three months, I, I switch them off again. The project is over, the cost disappears. Um, I can deactivate the users so that the username still remain in the system, but I don't pay the license fee anymore and I can archive all the stuff. That would be really, really, really beneficial. Um, and uh, that you can mix different levels of licenses and uh, that you can scale incrementally one seat at a time and not 50, 100 more, whatever. That's right. Yeah. That's great feedback, thank you. I'm sure you've heard it before. We're not the first one probably to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and he has his you're, you're not, from... but we're yeah. trying to at least improve the premium offerings so that it's easier to justify the price because especially in the very beginning, even like we kind of recognized that with the existing feature set, it would be really hard to justify the price, but hopefully by adding better and more features, it's easier to show the value, but regarding the the price and like kind of seat flexibility. Um, it's, not, it's not just a question of showing the value in the price because the majority of my users will never use those features. For instance, on the software side, right. you, have, yeah. you, ha you have the, um, the roadmap feature, right? To have the roadmap feature, you must go into the premium user. At my company, maybe a half a dozen will use the roadmap feature. 
but everyone will have to pay for it, even though 95% uh, don't use it. So what you are, was saying before, instead of giving more features, it means more meaningful. It's still a subset of people that will use those highly specialized, highly meaningful features. So for a CEO to say, I still have to, you know, fork up, you know, 95% of a freebie somewhere that is not useful to me. He's still going to ask me, can you go look at Microsoft solutions or this other solution over there? Because I can tailor to that. Yeah. And I would love to say, oh, we don't have to. Because that is feedback also in the chat now from Thomas, that this is the main point between you and Microsoft. So if it's Teams and SharePoint and, and whatnot, uh, or your solution, uh, in Microsoft, I can mix and match. I can mix the, the most expensive E5 license with uh, an exchange uh, mail account uh, and can manage them all under one domain. And I pay only for what I take from the menu. And there are basically no um, larger increments than one. And uh, Microsoft basically allows you to switch that off on a monthly basis. That would really, really help. And because that is common practice with so many cloud services, if you look at Miro or at, at uh, Microsoft, which may be your big, biggest competitor in that arena, um, it's always per seat, per month, and I can be very flexible in scalability also as far as license costs go. And I can mix and match licenses. That's, that's, all that, that's right. Yeah. So, so what I want to add to what Jörg says is a mindset change, Lauren. Yeah. What I've, I've heard from Atlassian, from you and from others, is that you want to add more features to make it uh, palatable. And what we're asking is, even with more features, we would like to have the freedom to select which horse to ride. You know, a big horse for an admin, a smaller horse, a pony for a smaller person. And I haven't heard a positive response on the, on the willingness to consider a more um, open licensing across the various group types. Right? Yeah, I don't think that's something, it's not been discussed internally or I, I haven't heard about a decision to change it currently, I'm just being honest. Um, we've definitely heard feedback about it before, but um, I mean, every, mention helps like the more that we hear the feedback the more that it might be considered for changing um but right now there's nothing that's currently being worked on or considered for it um your points are very valid and i don't i acknowledge that they're very valid and uh, i think it would definitely help us as an organization in remaining competitive but pricing and packaging decisions are made at the kind of founder level like it's not um, it's, we can translate the feedback up as much as we can, but the decision on how to price are made by people that it's kind of above my pay grade personally. Yeah, um, not, okay. not to use that as an excuse. I don't think it is one. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say, but like it, it's the leadership that does ultimately determine, um, kind of where our price lies and what's the kind of future of our business. And. Um, but feedback always helps and all the feedback from these sessions that we've been doing well is written up and shared on Confluence throughout the entire organization. So it's not that it goes nowhere. So it's still worth being brought up. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. There's the feedback uh, from the chat. <laughs> Please talk about this. So every vote counts. And that may yeah. be a, a good topic for an article in the community and just ask, is yeah. that something that you are discussing? Is that a comparison point when your manager comes to you and your pointy head boss and asks you about why aren't we using Microsoft? Because uh, there I can save money because I don't need that many licenses. Yeah. We, have so. the, we have literally the same. So uh, yeah. we have like literally uh, had to take in down some uh, requests from users because the, uh, the product owners or uh, like some, some managers, it's like a way too small amount of the users to justify like a pricing for a yearly license of 15, 20K uh, or something. So like when you have say like, yeah, how many users do you have? Like two, yeah, okay, we will not buy uh, a 20K uh, add-on 
for that year. If you have like, uh, if we could have like specific separator uh, not based on the uh, base of the users, of the basic amount of the users, but of the amount of the users who use that add-on, that would really, really improve that. And we would, or I would say uh, there would be more possibilities and more add-ons bought on the, on the marketplace as well. Yeah, that's the first step actually. If you could do that just on the add-on side and then bring it on the Jira con uh, software and Confluence, it's a two-pronged piece and they work in the same way. Mm -hmm. But I have this problem when I bring a Confluence uh, uh, contractor he's paying for all of my Jira software as well, or I have to pay for him to access just a restricted part of Confluence, but I have to pay for all the software that he will never be able to use. Mm -hmm. So this is a hard thing. I mean, I get beat by my management over that. Why should I pay for somebody else who's just doing this contract here and is not using any of this? Mm -hmm. So it's a hard sale. But the good news is the people like your features and the people like your product. Yes. Um, but uh, they really would like <laughs> I to use it. I appreciate that we <laughs> attempt at some positivity, but <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, no, this is, no, I'm po here to hear this. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not trying to disregard. No, you have, a, you have a great product, but that the point is you are not cheap anymore. And it's, it's, really, mm -hmm. uh, it's really now an investment decision. That, that's not like 10 years ago where Jira was basically a guerrilla product that you could just buy from some, uh, I don't know, buy fewer postage stamps and introduce Jira. That was the decision. But now that's, uh, that's a major investment decision to introduce uh, the product even into a smaller organization. And, and every, every bit that you can take off this pain, make this pain a bit more manageable and, and manage those costs better would really, really help with the acceptance of your great product that you have. So the good news is great product. But All right. uh, yeah, but money is still an issue. So. so so here's an example of money versus features. I mean, I love the features and that's why I'm here today. You know, mm -hmm. setting aside two hours to listen to you mm -hmm. and I'm glad I came, <laughs> right? Um, two years ago, we, two, three years ago, we actually started the, the, the cloud version. We paid about $5,000 a year. <clears throat> and today we, we grew as a company uh, two and a half times. And now we pay that almost on a monthly basis. So while the, the company grew two and a half times, the cost grew almost 10 times. It's more like seven or eight. So yeah. if the growth had occurred price-wise with the growth of the company, I could make that a case. But yeah. when the cost increased two and a half times, and you might ask, why did it increase so much? Well, in part because we added Confluence, uh, because with a larger company, then Confluence became a meaningful product, but also because we needed to add certain uh, add-ons. Mm -hmm. And now all of this, you know, uh, goes against the whole, um, the whole ecosystem of the users. Mm -hmm. So just realize the price scheme that you have, another message that you have to see, does not scale linearly. It scales way up. Like, uh, I forget the name of that... Uh, Exponential. 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 There we go. Yeah. It increases exponentially. Yeah. And that's a, that's a marketing nonsense from a price structure. Mm. Yeah. And I In guess any case. You, yeah. And I guess you would find a lot of examples <clears throat> where you have a growth of the company, which is X. And um, you have a, a growth of the costs, which is seven, eight times X. Yeah. You cannot explain that to your management. So we are twice as many people but I'm paying eight times as much for the, the stuff that you work with. Yeah. That, and that's my dilemma, by the way, mm -hmm. you know, it's a hard sale for me to make. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes it's like uh, more of a struggle because like some add-ons are really awesome for administrators, but since you pay them uh, on the user basis, it's like a blocker. So they should actually be, the opposite of exponential uh, in pricing. So they should be uh, reduced if you have like more uh, user base or something because uh, we had to take in some down or decide against some because the uh, our managers have said like, hey, how about no? It's like, do you have like a business reason to use it? And 
Yeah, that's a bit hard to say. You're arguing for your own work and your own productivity yeah. as yeah. an individual as opposed to the masses. So if they're looking at what's beneficial to the, the whole company, they won't choose yeah. the apps and add-ons that help the administrators because that's such a small group. Yeah. But you yeah. all would save a lot of time. You might be more secure, as was mentioned in the chat, or you might um, be more effective as an administrator with that app, but you're paying for the entire organization. But yeah. you're you are kind of like arguing on your own work yeah. and the like, uh, kind of selling yourself and your work and the promise of your own productivity as much as you are. Yeah, it feels it feels a bit hard that I, as an admin, have to sell uh, an add-on which benefits my work. Only and you. Yeah. Let, let me uh, or let's our admin group like perform our jobs way more efficiently. And, mm -hmm. and way more precisely, uh, and or I have more feel that or more have whatever feel just by yeah. every year that we use it, that it is beneficial and stuff. It's like an uh, annoying, and I actually could use the time to do something else. Okay, yeah. but I feel an article coming on, and if nobody objects, I will write well, this down and put it on community. For every um, feature or product launch, when making the decision about um, how and how it will perform or how it will act. Um, we pull in, we do customer research. So probably you all have been approached by a bunch of Alassians like myself that want to talk to you about a particular feature. But then if you haven't, like, um, I, I mean, generally I ask the community for like um, personal feedback too, but we also go and reference community. So we'll pull out a bunch of links to different community articles or discussions where we see the feature that we're working on is being discussed and that does play directly into how that feature is built um, pricing like i said is such a at such a high level it's like more difficult <laughs> to yeah. i don't know how often they're checking community but it still can be pulled in like i think frequently product marketing managers and product managers pull in um, what is being discussed on community, they use that as a resource to, and for intel and for insights. And because you all are using the products more than even we are sometimes and for different reasons or different use cases that we're trying to build for. And so we go to that as a place to learn and gain insight and get feedback, um, just like in conversations like this. And so, of course, like always publishing on community is better than just like, um, I don't know, not publishing on community or not saying anything at all because like that is something that is checked. And like as a part of any product launch, we do the interviews, we look at community, we look at Jack tickets, we pull those all onto a page and say, okay, here's all the existing feedback about this potential new feature or functionality and how can we like build with these in mind. So uh, we try to be good citizens <laughs> and build for things that are real, but that I think the most challenging thing about this conversation is that pricing is like different. Like it's not, not just building yeah. a feature. It's like, it's something that's decision decided at a, like a business model and business strategy level that I'm like, I, I cannot touch pricing like personally, except that I can go and say, Hey, here's a ton of feedback. Everyone look, let me publish a blog on it, <laughs> you oh. know, and like circulate that internally to show, Hey, this is a real problem for customers, but um, yeah, just to like give you a little bit of insight into how we work. Yeah. Um, no, that's understood, and, and it's not a it's not a complaint, uh, especially not against you. But it's, oh no! Uh, oh no! The, I just... the positive news for you is you are doing an excellent job. Everybody wants to use your product. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, I'm not offended. Okay. I would, like <laughs> okay. only your your business level has a problem because they do not listen to your users. So that's yeah. The, it's, so well, you're doing it's a, you are doing an excellent job. That's that's the first. yeah yeah. It's it's but it's hard, that's, and I that's don't. That's true, by the way. I'm not trying yeah. to disregard it, though. You know, like that's yeah. kind of where we are. Or, or I'm not trying to make excuses, but like you're. I'm I'm saying all this because I want to. Encourage yeah. you to no, keep posting, talking. So the decision is let us start that conversation. So um, mm -hmm. um, I will write something in community or send out a draft, and then we will see who answers. And if that creates enough of a wave in community at Lessingcom, maybe the gods will look at it and uh, <laughs> notice that we have a problem. Yeah. 
because yeah. so, so so when you talk yeah. sorry yeah, um lauren when you talk to your management um go back to the original uh root cause of why we changed the scheme uh the fee scheme as it is today if you remember we had difficulty you had difficulties uh with the number of users on the add-ons and the number of users on the system and it was a simplification process that benefited you and your partners Mm -hmm. And now looking back a couple of years later, you can see how it is now uh, taxing your user base more heavily than it should be. The pendulum went the other way because it needed to go and solve a problem, but it went too far. The pendulum needs to come back more to the middle. So from a business standpoint, you don't want to lose the simplification you accrued with the partners and with you, but you do need to consider the need of you know, the base that actually pays your paycheck, namely that it's gone too far and it comes, needs to come back more to the middle. So, so yeah. it's not like I'm asking, just reduce the price, you know, give me um, a tier like at Microsoft, but you also have a problem to solve, namely what solved the old problem still needs to be, you know, taken into yeah. consideration. So your management will say, aha, we have the solution on the old problem and now we have a solution for the new one and both can somewhat be, you know, made. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I do remember clearly when it was announced and why it was announced. So we may have to go back to the original solution that this introduced. When you say um, it was adding simplification for partners and for us as a business, do you mean having um, breaking out the different pricing tiers in that kind of blanket way? Is that like what you mean by that? It, in a way, yes, but it made it much simpler for partners to be paid. Mm. To, you know, okay. to, to, so it simplified the relationship between you and, and a vendor who provides an add-on of some sort. You know, right. it was measured on the same level. You know, the unit was the user. Right. And it was a very simple way to adjust. I mean, I understand that so part. the exact same kind of like pricing yeah. structure. You pay for every user within this plan in Atlassian, and you also pay for every user yeah. on a particular site or instance yes. when using an app. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they kind of copy pasted the same business model. Which, will, which was a great them. idea, but the price mm -hmm. that was imposed on these single users became a little bit uh, less economical for yeah. them. Okay. for us. I just think that status quo was not questioned uh, so openly. So everyone was just discussing about the features, which is great, uh, but the uh, pricing model needs to be uh, discussed as well. I think that status quo needs to be changed. Yeah. Or challenged, at least. <laughs> yeah. And send me the link as well when you all do publish it. Like, send it to me as well so that I, I probably will find it if I search. Do you have any mail? Yeah, we have it. I will, I will forward that. And I, will, forward it? Okay. I will provide a link that, that um, I will find out some way to that we can work on a draft if I have to mail it around or whatnot, but I have your mail addresses and everything. So yeah. that would be great. If there's not yeah. traction, it, it could warrant a, a blog, an internal blog on my part too. Yeah. Or you can um, just reference so. it somewhere that there's a discussion yeah. going on. Um, right. So let's, let's finish that discussion here because um, I have another feature discussion, uh, which may be all as uncomfortable as the licensing discussion. <laughs> uh, that's a European question. Um, is there a roadmap that we will get a European cloud? So why do I ask? Last week we had this, uh, the highest court in the European Union decided that the privacy shield with the United States is no good. So transferring data to the U United States is difficult now uh, and there's basically no legal basis for doing that, especially uh, except uh, standard contract clauses that you also have, but these are not as good as the privacy shield was. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question is, um, will we get a European cloud, which would be very helpful under European data protection yeah. regulations? And there is a, there's a, a, a mention in the Atlassian architecture document that says you are always provisioned in the nearest AWS region closest to, to you. So if I'm provisioning an instance in, in Berlin, I will be provisioned in AWS Frankfurt, but there's no guarantee. So 
yeah. and the question is the roadmap for us poor Europeans with our GDPR, will we get a European cloud anytime soon? So that we yeah. can say to our authorities, hey, the, the data is not leaving the European Union and Atlassian keeps us at home, basically. Yeah, this is one I do know a lot about, but I'm afraid it does, it may come back to pricing. And so um, a feature that I worked on a while back before my Confluence days, I was on the, the cloud platform team and they're working on a feature called data residency for our cloud products, but it's offered in an even higher tier <laughs> in the new enterprise tier. So this is a part of um, Atlassian's kind of huge attempt to make cloud products viable for large businesses. So that's why it does kind of like fall within that, that tier, but the feature itself, because we do have an AWS data center within Frankfurt, um, as you all know, uh, but this feature promises that all, um, all like kind of primary data for your Confluence Jira instance is hosted within that particular AWS data center. Um, so it is kind of like, but I mean, the, the problem that we as a team experienced internally is like, okay, so we're promising that most of this data stays within this like Frankfurt data center within the EU. Great. But like the GDPR law is very fuzzy. It, it, it's not very clear on <laughs> exactly. So like as if a support person from the U S is trying to help you with your cloud instance and they need to access that cloud instance um, are like if they use proper means to do so to access your Frankfurt data center and look at your data, um, is that breaking GDPR? Um, and GDPR is not very clear on that. Like it is kind of fuzzy. So that's why all of our lawyers internally say that you, we cannot promise GDPR compliance with this feature because there are too many kind of like gray areas with the legislation that lead to us like being in potentially dangerous water by promising anything at all. <laughs> yeah, and but so, yeah, but now you are in really deep water and there are sharks swimming around. So that's the problem <laughs> yeah. since last week. So there's, it's really, no, I know. That's really Jaws kind of territory. So you're yeah, in a little boat and the great white shark comes into it. No, but I know um, it's something we struggle with. And like, I mean, yeah. we look at, and you're not the only one in that problem, by the way. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, Google has the exact same offering as we do in terms of like, they promise that it's hosted in a particular region. Like most of the data is there, but they can't promise GDPR compliance. Same with Microsoft and even um, same with like, I don't know, ServiceNow, I think also does this, but then it's interesting. See, like what I don't always understand is that like, I talked to a bunch of German folks like yourself that use Atlassian products. And I was like, but you're using Slack. Slack has no GDPR, like zero. And they're like, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Our people really want Slack. And so we're willing to take on that risk. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I like, we, of course, we're still trying to build this feature. It takes a lot of work and time because it has to do with the back end of our products and how data flows and moves between them. So they started building this, I don't know, three years ago and they yeah. just announced it at the last like virtual summit for the first time. Oh, cute kid, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so it takes a long time to You're build saying up. hi, Lauren. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, and so they've been working on it for a really long time because they know that this is an issue and it's something that is mentioned all the time on community. It's mentioned yeah on Jack tickets, like what we call the Jira, like request tickets, like we know this is a pain point. It took a long time to build it, but now we're here. It's in a, a high price tier because it took a lot of time and money to, for us to build it. Um, they're building it for large organizations because that's like where they can justify the price for us to build it versus the yeah. um, output. And then also we still can't promise GDPR compliance because of like all of the gray area that I just mentioned. And so it's like 
honestly a super painful topic and one that like I don't have a great answer on except that we're trying really hard um and there is a lot being like if I brought my PM on it this call he would just be like so passionate and so he's like I'm trying I'm like building it taking a long time but it just I have, I have no three good. comments. I have three comments. The first one, I hate Slack, so I'm with you on that. Um, <laughs> well, the second but, one, but you don't. still use that. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> because it, I pushed you. But they don't have any GDPR to. compliance. That's what blows no. my mind. Is they don't they don't yeah. have any promise of keeping data within the EU at yeah, all. They don't. And do people still all. use it there. And yeah. so I'm like, so then why are we putting all this money and time into building something that, like, yeah. people yeah, use anyway? Because you, you know will what I mean? be, yeah, you. But because you will be audited, Slack won't. That's yeah. the point. And, yeah. and yeah, the stride was killed, yes. Yeah, the second the second comment would be I Wait, loved it. Was loved that it. a mention of stride? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I have a soft spot. I don't know. I worked on it for a little bit and it, it had its moment for a short short time. Yeah, my second comment would be I love the GDPR. It's much better than we had what we had before. And it's um and you are actually quite good with the GDPR because you are compliant to the California Code of Data Protection, which is actually very similar to the GDPR with a few differences. So you, I don't see a problem if you uh, introduce the data res residency in Europe, uh, my personal opinion. And I, I, and I know legal minds that think alike. Um, the third comment is, um, if you ha have somebody to talk to about that, uh, please make this available for all pricing tiers as an add-on, as whatnot, because we need it. To, to, because to, you need it to do business. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Um, no, it was, there was a lot of debate. That's an understatement, but there was a lot of debate about what tier it would be in. And I don't know that will, it will always be in this enterprise yeah. tier. I think they will have to evaluate that at the risk of losing all European customers, particularly those in Germany, they're very privacy yeah. oriented, but um, I think that will change. Like, I think they will have to, um, and there are even plans um, to have that change and be in different pricing tiers. I don't think free, no. but like standard and premium at least, yeah. but the issue remains around like what is GDPR compliance and like, especially with this new change with the, like the privacy sh shield changing like so then what is proper we can never even externally say even with this this feature that we are GDPR compliant because um because like certain mechanisms for using uh, accessing that data from the U.S. when needed to or accessing it from um Australia with the permission of the customer like still doesn't cons isn't fall within the the GDPR guidance and so we can never say that externally and so I mean you will never see us say that you will be GDPR compliant by using this feature because we cannot promise that based on like a, what is a, <laughs> yeah we will have a separate talk about that in 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 September mm -hmm. uh, we're actually a platinum partner will talk about why GDPR and Atlassian are best friends forever um so I would really invite you and your PM to that talk in September. Yeah, definitely. I think because we that. Because that will be, because we are also a bit under shock because of the decision last week. Yeah. Um, and one painful thing that changed is until now, uh, the national data protection agencies had a choice if they want to audit or not. That was within their, um, yeah, they could basically uh, decide on their own. Last week, the European court said, no, you have to. So they do not have a, uh, they do not have a decision power anymore in that instance. So mm -hmm. if somebody complains, Atlassian is violating my data protection rights, they have to yeah. audit. And until now, they could have make a choice. And that's why this, and this situation will now exist for at least two years. It took as long to, to, to replace the safe harbor, which was the predecessor of Privacy Shield. Yeah. Um, and that has to be, be resolved quickly because that is threatening a lot of business here, I would say. I think we, we brought up that topic during the team tour and also uh, when we were in Vienna. Mm -hmm. I think we discussed it yeah. with, uh, with a bunch of Atlassians and we were like first saying, okay, like we see that Europe is a great market and we need to have like a, a data center within that region. Uh, but there was not much follow-up about it uh, 
regarding I mean, there is the data center in yeah. Frankfurt yeah. Um, that launched I forget was it I think it was end of last year um, yeah. the, they announced they were opening that AWS data center um, yeah. So that's still there and that is true. I mean, what they say around like, if you are a, um, like a German customer and you sign up for our products and m most of your data is being used within the EU, then they will primarily use the, the AWS data center that's closest to you for performance reasons. So that there's reduced latency so that there's like not, they're not calling across the globe, right? Um, so that remains to be true, but we can't promise that because like, um, yeah, for this other feature, we basically put more blockers in place to prevent it from leaving. <laughs> um, whereas like um, just with our regular features with free standard, all of them, um, it will be there for optimization and performance reasons. But if there is some shift in usage, for example, if you have a bunch of like contractors using it from the US or something, then um, it, some of the data might be pulled over there. And so that's why it's not GDPR compliant. I mean, I know that they have done a lot of work internally to set us up so that we can be audited so that if they need to come in and track exactly where your data went, they have all the means to do so. And that was like a huge two, two year effort to be completely like in compliance. And so that when someone comes in, we can track like where their data has gone or been accessed. So that is in place and our like head of legal and also like head of compliance, um, George and Erica, they did led those efforts and they're incredibly good human beings and like really um, took it very seriously and put a lot of work behind it um, just to be able to call us like GDPR compliance if we like as an organization, not your own compliance, but our compliance, um, if we were to be audited they can track and trace things across our platforms. Um, that's why we put up that page that's like, we are GDPR compliant or whatever, or we, we provide the proper mechanisms for you to be, and we as, a, as an organization are GDPR compliant um, and help and support you in that effort. But like, yeah, I don't think we can say that even anymore with this privacy shield change, so. Okay. So question for you on, on compliance, since you, you, we approached the topic, we're in the healthcare industry, finance, mm -hmm. uh, specifically of uh, co Are you ask about HIPAA? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> I have three of them. One is HIPAA, one is PCI, and the other one is high trust. Uh, do you know the status on those for Confluence? Hmm? Okay, HIPAA is being worked on, but first for JIRA, not Confluence. I think like Confluence is the next in the, here, let me so get it. JIRA first. Um, yeah, that's what the kind of like, um, let me go to our trust site. So um, there is a roadmap on our trust site that I shows. I can share that link, I have it. So yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, for privacy and compliance. Coming and the high trust is on that list as well? In the works. Yeah, HIPAA for Jira Cloud. I don't know about high trust personally. Like maybe this is just like a blind spot for us. What is um So high trust is the next level. HIPAA is, you know, the idea of preserving the information of a of a particular patient, right? So how you treat it, yeah. who has access to it, uh, as you move or store or whatever you do. PCI is about the credit card and high trust. We, we have is, PCI. I do know that. You have PCI? Okay. For all of our products for, yeah, so let me go, I can send both the compliance page and the roadmap I just mentioned. I'll send it in the chat. Yep. Um, so high so, trust is the next level. Uh, organizations that are large, usually governmental based or uh, oversight by, over, by governments, such as hospitals tend to be. Uh, there's this element called high trust where you not only have to say, uh, I protect your data according to HIPAA, but uh, uh, my processes are being audited every every month, every six months, if not every year, depending on the level you want. And if mm -hmm. you lose the high trust the certification, then you lose the ability to service all your customers. 
Yeah. So, so for us, uh, being high trust, we won't even be able to get a contract with a hospital to provide the service to them, unless we can say we are, you know, we have a high trust compliance, and there oh, are different wow. levels for it. One, one of the, the lowest one is HIPAA plus high trust, and then the next one up is just plain high trust. So we're just okay. move, moving up the chain here. But so our problem with this is regarding Atlassian is that. Uh, We've had to stand like crazy just to avoid putting any data that could be construed to be HIPAA data or PCI data or high trust mm -hmm. data. So, you know, we create the stories to build the product. And yet when we have issues that we're trying to solve from the customers, we have to find an alternate means right. to deal with the data for the bugs. So we can't use Atlassian to deal with the data that is not compliant. Right if that makes sense. So it's, it's a source of truth for creation of the product, but it's not the source of truth for managing the live data that is out there, unless it's compliant. And if right. the idea is to be a single source of truth, for us compliance becomes core. Squeaky here. Um, yeah, no, I, I definitely, I've heard a lot about the pain points of not having HIPAA and that's why I think um, George Chotev, he's our head of compliance. He is working on it and put it on the roadmap. Um, Do you want me to send you some information about high trust? Yeah, definitely. And like, I know him well, um, so I can send that on to him and ask if he's considered or heard much about high trust because okay. I don't know a ton myself. Um, we have mainly heard about HIPAA, but if that's kind of like, uh, need to have or just a best practice for working with hospitals, then that should definitely be something that is on his radar. Um, I can't speak to PCI, like we, Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, Opsgenie, Status Page, and Trello are all PCI DSS compliant for last year. They'll probably go in and post um, our certifications for 2020 soon, if they haven't already, I think. Um, there's this guy named Bill Marriott who manages all the information on this site and um, uh, deals with like updating our compliance certifications and posting them. So um, he might just be a little bit slow on that. But um, yeah, I mean, any information you can send on high trust would be good. I can definitely answer that. Perfect. I sent over the compliance site that lists each certification along with links to the actual certificate. Uh, yes, and then, yes, yes, yes. Um, the roadmap is an indicator of what at a high level, it's very like kind of loose terms, but it's what is currently being worked on or soon to launch. Um, and so in the compliance section, HIPAA for JIRA Align is soon to come and then um, in the works is HIPAA for Jira Cloud. Any other topics? I have to ask because we just broke the record for longest. I have meeting. still one topic okay. from, <laughs> from eBay. So, and I think that's something that um, you are perfect person to, to ask about the future request on Confluence because I, the most requested feature of Confluence is to remove the bars from Confluence. Remove Easy the as that, removing bars, like top and left bar on the view of that Confluence okay. page. It's the most requested feature I ever heard. It's like five out of 10 requests is about that. I don't want to see the top bars. I don't want to see the left bar. Something like, I don't know. Jira service desk view or just plain A4 format, whatever. I don't want to see all the, these buttons because they confuse me and I don't feel comfortable with them. Mm. So when they are using it for just viewing pages, so not when editing, but when surfing around Confluence, looking up whatever they need, need to see, they look at a pet page and they don't want to see the home, the top now. Exactly. Or, because or it's taking a lot of space. Of course, you can left bar, you can shrink, yeah. but the top bar you cannot. And especially when you look, uh, when you work only on laptop, like all our uh, leadership team does the do. So, yeah. 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 I mean, that's good feedback. It's, um, would you, 
how would you imagine that playing out? So you sometimes do need to access the top bar. Would you imagine that it, it uh, unfurls when you need it, when you hover over that area of the page? Or um, I would do um, like it... small button on the left or right corner with when you click on it, you it will expand all the layout or something like that. So, so you, you can see, for like example, infused. Jira services, how mm -hmm. it looks like, or you can look on the refined space for Confluence, but it's only for server. It doesn't apply for the cloud version. Yeah. And I think, and uh, mm, refined uh, theme for the Confluence, it's much more than just layout. So, and it's co quite complex tool. And I would like to just simple view like that you have like only the page, no bars, nothing, because people doesn't like all the buttons and so on. Right. Robert, do you remember if the Lively Apps app works in cloud? Uh, no. no, and okay. you need to also attach as a script, and if it's blocked by the uh, ad block or something, it broke. So oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So and oh. a lot of developers using the anti-script uh, blocker and so on. So any CSS changes like on the user side will not work. So you're asking for full screen mode? Something like that, yeah. Like uh, what we have here in Zoom. Exactly, yeah, something like that, easy mm -hmm. as that, like just clicking a button, hiding everything and just uh, focus on reading. So even if I'm as a user have a problem with that, especially when I work only on laptop, when I'm sitting on the couch and yeah. it takes a lot of space and I don't want to do that to, to, to see. Yeah? yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um... And as I'm saying, it's like for any of my clients, it's like 14,000 people in eBay, 15 commerce bank, all of them are requesting, hey, listen, I don't want to see that buttons <laughs> anymore. Okay. Can you do something with that? And I said, no. <laughs> Is there something that I can point to to prove that, um, that you are getting so many requests that you're hearing this so often from the customers that you work with? Um, or yeah, maybe you can pass along kind of some of the stats that you just said me to me, like the number of requests or like some somehow whenever I translate that back or like say what feedback I'm hearing, mm -hmm. I can give a feeling of the volume that you're hearing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. That mm -hmm. definitely adds more power and kind of persuasion to any kind of feedback. So um, maybe I, mean, I can send you an email or something about my feedback as a administrator of the enterprise level clients and that's it yeah here i don't know i i'm opening myself up for um... because if you even ask any kind of manager like in any company i i'm pretty sure that five out of ten or maybe even seven or eight out of ten will complain about ui because yeah. i'm working with atlas and tools for last 10 years and it's always the same story yeah it gets better um, with that expand and so on, on, but it's only cloud again. And, and I don't want to install that refine team because I don't like it and it's uh, quite slow. So that's also the problem. So I check it once with the client and it doesn't work for cloud also. So that's a different story. But for the data center and so on, it's pretty slow and I don't want to wait for loading and you need to use special macros or it's even named some section or something differently. So yeah. Yeah, no, that's good feedback. But okay, you can so see that refine team, how they solve that. Oh, oh, sorry. Maybe you can also check it like refine team and how they solve at least. Yeah, I know that it, um, like Airbnb, they use, uh, I think refined to remove all of the kind of like uh, top and right or top and left sections of Confluence for their user base. And they're kind of like the most customized of our customers and that they're the way that they use Jira Service Desk and Confluence is probably the most customized I've ever seen. It's like quite frankly beautiful. It's amazing what they've been able to do, but um, I didn't know that it was slow. They're using it for data center and I didn't know that. But you are also losing that, that you don't have that bar also when you want to have it and then what? Right. <laughs> so something for something, yeah? And it should yeah. be just button or whatever, like full screen mode. That's it. Like the uh, uh, Gerard mentioned. Right, like Zoom. Okay, any other questions? Any other topics feature related or otherwise? Going once. Thank you all for being so open with your feedback. I really appreciate it. 
and so engaged with me now. I know it's not always easy via Zoom. So that that's what we are here for. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for spending this much time with, with us. Of and course. Thank you for answering mm -hmm. our questions and your feedback and your introduction. It was very helpful and. Um, it looks like this is going to be uh, the beginning of a fruitful discussion about several topics. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, and thank you again. Thank you, Lauren. That was very fruitful. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I hope more comes out of it. <laughs>